Hello, uh, Paul Beck with uh, back on the AGU mashup. So, I'm going to talk about a um, very interesting uh, talk that shows these strong correlations between the timing of snow retreat in western Siberia over the western Siberia plain and uh, how that correlates to sea ice retreat in the Laptev Sea, where the, the ice is all but disappearing, um, where, whereas it never used to. So. Basically, um, the West Siberian plain, um, the, the snow retreated uh, by April 25th, and that was a 7.8 sigma event. So an extremely rare, um, you know, rare onset or, of, or loss of, 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 of snow on the West Siberian plains. June 17th, the Laptev sea ice melting uh, started and by July 27th, the ice had retreated to 15%. So we lost 85% of the ice in the Laptev Sea. So the correlation between those events, is you, if you go back to, to in, through different years and look at the, uh, those two parameters, the snow in Western Siberia and the ice loss, they're very well correlated. Now correlation doesn't mean causation, but you could argue that the meridional, meridional circulation pattern, in other words, the jet streams became much wavier, much more north-south, and they were affected um, by the, uh, the snow melt, and then uh, they were also, you know, they translated into more ice melt. So like a minus uh, Arctic oscillation-like response, um, also a correlation to the uh, Eurasian uh, snow cover as well, else, elsewhere. So, um, so, so basically, the idea is that the, um, you know, the snow retreats on the Western Siberian plain, okay, or plateau plain, um, and then the land, there's a lot, the land will heat up a lot more, okay, there's a lot more absorption, the surface is darker, there's a lot more absorption, it heats up. That heat rises up and displaces where the jet streams are, and the jet streams then are wavier, and then they carry a a ridge over the over the eastern Siberian Sea, and they melt out the ice in the Laptev Sea because there's downwelling, long wave radiation, temperature rise, and there's also water vapor transported there. Um, so early sea ice retreat years can be correlated back to. Uh, uh, to to loss of the snow, so the the chain of events, WSP early snow retreat, say day 115, 115th day of the year or before, that's the Western uh, Siberian plain snow retreat. Then you get the temperature rising over that region, then it amplifies the Rossby wave, uh, and you get more water vapor carried by the jets. The jets are wavier. So by day, uh, by day, uh, so days greater than 167 days, you get Laptev Sea melting, and then you get the Laptev Sea basically melted out by, you know, down or to the 85% level by day 205. So day 205, it's gone. Um, day 115, the snow is gone over Siberia, so that's a 90 day lag. And so, so we're seeing this. We're seeing good correlation with this. So you know, it seems that it's you can you can make a case that it's tied directly to the to the jet stream. But that might be a predictor of I of of when the what's what the ice is going to do in a given year. You know, if we look at what the snow is doing, and then we can say, okay, we know what the ice is going to do in 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 uh, you know the next two or three months. Um, Ceres, um and. There, there was a paper with Ceres, uh, Arctic sea ice response to the passage of synoptic scale cyclones. So when we talk about weather maps of North America, that's sort of synoptic scale, the scale of, of, of weather, you know, weather maps. Um, and we look at storm tracks um, and we can compare, uh, try to relate storm tracks to the sea ice extent. Um, so the, uh, the sea ice concentration is measured to a 10 kilometer resolution with the AMSR-2 satellite and then we the uh, infrared uh, data is from the ERA and then the National Snow and Ice Data Center ice um, model and measurements so that's all used basically and 
you know what of course in august 2012 there were some major cyclones july 2014 also december 2015 um so they looked at case studies of some big cyclones and what happened with the ice now cyclones they they spread the ice out they cause they cause uh, divergence of the ice. So if the ice is sitting here, the cyclone goes through, it spreads it out. This is what normally happens, right? Um, and, uh, but sometimes uh, this is not happening uh, because the ice is so thin that the cyclone is just ripping chunks off the ice and then carrying it in different places. So we're seeing this behavior. You know, when the ice was thicker and more robust, there would be divergence in the, in the sea ice. Um, as the cyclones pass by, but now you can get more, uh, you know, it doesn't always happen now. You can get big chunks, big regions torn off and displaced elsewhere. Um, and uh, the cyclone lifetimes uh, seem to be lasting longer. I think I've mentioned that in previous videos. Um, so, so there, there was basically uh, within so the timing was looked at, you know, after within 48 hours um, of, of a storm uh, reaching a region, there, there was a large influence detectable in, in the sea ice concentration under the storm. This was looked at within storms and outside the storms. It was divided up into March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December, January, February to try to decide because the ice is going to be at different phases, different strengths in, so we would expect that the behavior to cyclones would, would, would vary. So also it was done at different sections of the Arctic and it was, so there was, there was statistical analysis done and comparisons it's found that June, July, August, much greater storm activity in those months and those are the months when the sea ice is, is melting. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of temperature differences, higher winds, higher cyclone generation. The long-term trend in Arctic cyclones is a bit unclear. It doesn't seem to be more necessarily, but they seem to be getting stronger. Um, also, you know, I talked about, it relates back to the Beaufort Gyre. The Beaufort High would tend to act as a mountain, if you like, and push away cyclones. So as that's decreased, and you get a pathway of the jet stream going up into that region, then you can get more and more cyclones going up and higher and higher into the Arctic. And of course, the Coriolis force is maximum at the poles. So once you get these cyclones churning around in the Arctic Ocean, they, as soon as they start heading south, they veer sharply. Um, they veer sharply to the, uh, to, to, to the right and, 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 and stay in, in the Northern Hemisphere, stay in the basin. Okay, so now to the South Pole, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current Front, sea ice variability, and the tropographic effects, so the bathymetry effects um, on the Antarctica circulation plus topography, wind and ocean effects, sea ice, was expanding until recently, about 1.5% per decade, but recently it's plummeted, and you've seen those map the, the, those graphs I've shown where you take the Arctic ice plus the Antarctic and you can see that they, they were plummeting last year and, and doing the same thing this year. So we're losing, you know, Arctic sea ice is still rapidly dropping, but the difference was that the Antarctic sea ice was plummeting. We're getting stronger winds down there, okay? There, so the temperature gradients are larger. Australia's baking, Antarctic's still cold. We're getting larger temperature gradients. Um, so we're getting lots of uh, more, uh, more churning of the ocean, uh, more mass loss of glaciers, more meander in the, in the ACC um, zonal winds. Um, the wind stress curl is larger, so that can be uh, driving the ice and, and, and uh, pulling the ice out away um, or thinning it out, okay, doing various things, uh, mixing up the water. Um, so the um so so basically but one of the interesting things is is the ice fronts um the topography the bathymetry so where how deep the water is underneath the ocean around antarctica is very crucial as to where those sea ice fronts are located because if you're near an area where you go from deep water to shallower water and you get the ocean currents underneath and you get the upwelling and that can melt the ice and, and that can restrict the extent of the sea ice in that region. 
Um, so you get these standing meanders, if you like, um, and uh, you know you get this huge topographic uh, influence. Um, so the the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the ACC, is least variable where you get the strongest um, uh, change in the topography, the strongest upwelling. Um, and so, so there, there have been noticeable differences in the freshness of the water. The water, of course, is freshening because there's more uh, ice melt um, from glaciers on land and ice shelves and stuff. So this, there's reduced ocean overturning. There's reduced Antarctic, um, uh, Antarctic uh, bottom water formation. So there's reduced overturning. So the reduced overturning, so there's lower O2. Um, and um, there's also uh, different spiral patterns in the ice. There's free flow over the abyssal plains and you get these nice spirals that are pinned to the topography. Um, and those spirals, the behavior of those spirals is changing as well. So, so definitely, um, and, then, and then there were talks back to the Arctic on you know, the mechanical interaction um, based, you know, the Beaufort Gyre, Labrador Current, the Fram Strait how you get these different filaments in the ice appearing. You know, they're like they're one dimensional, um, you know, chunks of ice that are extending out, for example, or you get the filaments going downwards in the bottom of the ice in the depth profile. Um, and this is because of, uh, you know, the water that is coming up and melting the ice is kind of chaotic. So, so it comes up and melts back some areas, other areas at least fingers, if you like, or, or filaments going down deep. Um, so, uh, you know, the mechanical, there, there was a bunch of equations given on the ice motion and the different cyclones and vortices that are formed. Um, so there's different eddies, you know, if you look um, from at, at visible images of the ocean, you see all these different as eddies, they're called mesoscale, medium scale eddies, some extend uh, deep down into the, into the water, you also get the same sort of thing um, with the ice, as the, in, with the ice, sea ice motion is moving around and you get these different eddies forming. Um, and uh, they're they're usually they're generally near the edge of the ice. They're they're not inside the ice too much. Um, the Amundsen Sea. There were talks on the Amundsen Sea um, lows. Um, the Amundsen Sea low um, generally accepted that there's a deeper low. Um, so so it's it's affecting the sea ice, the Ross Shelf. Um, it just, the, re the conclusion of this talk was, it's complicated. Sometimes this happens, sometimes that happens, it's complicated. So still a lot of questions in that region. Um, Mark England talked about the Arctic and Antarctic atmospheric responses. You know, lots of sea ice, it, with the Arctic sea ice loss, there's lots of papers relating that to the jet streams and the circulation patterns. But with the Antarctic sea ice loss, Okay, it's been gaining 1.5% per decade, but recently it's dropping off a cliff. So how is that changing the, the jet streams in the Southern Hemisphere? What impacts does it have on the atmosphere? Um, so they've looked at data going back from 1955 to 69, and then more recent data, and they're running these community Earth system models and these whole atmosphere models, and they're trying to look and see how these effects are. There's not a lot known on those effects and we can see you know if, if you live in Australia you know you know things are really wacky you know this 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 uh, summer it's our summer it's our winter you know things are really really wacky going going crazy huge temperature extremes etc cetera, etc cetera. you know different locations of the jet stream and so on so how that relates to the Antarctic sea ice is going to be you know a really important topic of, of uh, analysis um, how do sea ice melt ponds form? There's actually, you could look at the statistics without looking at the physics, you can just look at the statistics. You know that there's gonna be lots and lots of small ponds and, ver and fewer and fewer large ones, just like pebbles on a beach or sand crystals. Like that's a power distribution of size. And we see that pond in the ponding of ice on Antarctica, the ponds on the sea ice in, An in Antarctica and the Arctic and it, 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 it follows interestingly the math. Thank you.